A nefarious nightmare contains themes that may be explicit or triggering for some. Specific warnings and disclaimers will be mentioned in the show notes. A nefarious nightmare assumes all parties that are mentioned in these cases to be innocent unless proven guilty in a court of law. Listener discretion is strongly advised. You can help us grow the show by leaving us a five-star written review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or you can join our Patreon for lighthearted bonus content. With this... Welcome to Season 6. In today's episode, Mariah will continue to recall the events that led to the tragedy that occurred April 10th, 2023. We dive in a little more on the links to narcissistic personality disorder and domestic violence. Also posing the question of whether or not you always listen to your gut. The crime committed by Stephen Clare is a pure living nightmare one that had all the signs, albeit difficult to see. Narcissists are very thorough with carrying through their plan if it's something that will make them look good. We urge you all to recognize the signs of narcissistic abuse from family members and even friends, whether you've fallen victim to it and, as a reminder, if you or someone you love is a victim of domestic violence, please call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at one 800 799 SAFE or 1 800 799 7233, or you can visit thehotline.org. Advocates are there to listen without judgment and will offer you support and resources in your time of need. With all of that, I'm Courtney Fenner. And I'm Amanda Cronin. And in a nefarious nightmare presents Listen to Your Gut Justice for Willow, Part 2. When I interviewed Mariah, I noticed how incredibly kind she was and very much so proficient and careful in her recollection of events. But she was also your typical average human being that you would never guess upon meeting her that she had been through so much. And what struck me was her radiant smile and beauty, how she carried a strong likeness to Rose McGowan, which if you've looked at the pictures that we've posted on Instagram, you'll see that. And then her kindness was unwavering as much as her calls to action for justice and advocacy to make her daughter's voice be heard. This only showed me that the love that she had for her daughter, Baby Willow, as well as her surviving children was also unwavering. And I admire that so much about her and I can identify. This story is not just some true crime case. It's a story of a lioness protecting her cubs, her den, doing just about anything and everything to protect her own. A story that needs to be told over and over again, as it serves as both a heartbreaking reminder that people aren't who they may seem, and how a mother's love for her children is first and foremost. As we would come to find out, behind closed doors, a dark and troubling series of events was unfolding, which would ultimately shed light on the links between narcissistic personality disorder, and domestic violence. Mariah had been married to Stephen Clare, a charismatic and charming man who seemed to have it all. The key word is seemed, as you may have found out and will find out, but when no one knew was that Stephen likely suffered from narcissistic personality disorder, a condition that made him seem excessively self-absorbed lacking in empathy and prone to manipulation, gaslighting, and creating grandiose behavior. One comparison I can immediately draw as an example is the case of Christopher Dunksh. He was also known as Dr. Death, whose behavior was so grandiose that he insisted on performing surgeries, despite not being apt at it and causing extensive harm and ultimately death to his patients. Dr. Death came to mind many times listening to Mariah's story. There are quite a few parallels to both cases. As the relationship between Mariah and Stephen Clare had progressed, she started to notice disturbing patterns of behavior in her husband. It was, of course, not easy to see at first, but 
She began to realize that he was controlling, demanding constant admiration, and would lash out in fits of rage when he didn't get his way. These traits are classic signs of NPD, which, while we cannot diagnose anyone, I mean, if it walks and quacks, I mean, let's be real here, it's a duck. And the traits he carried caused a toxic environment within their home, ultimately causing their separation. We often talk about NPD because it's often linked to serial killers, serial rapists, and the like. I will reiterate that it isn't always because those are those with NPD who are self-aware and actually want to help others, but it is often. What we do not want to do is create a stigma surrounding NPD or any disorders that mimic it, but it is a factor that needs to be talked about when discussing these criminals. Narcissism is one of those disorders that often fools even licensed behavioral therapists, which ultimately caused a flying monkey in Mariah's case with her own therapist. It often starts with love bombing, and it is a long game most of the time where they often test the waters with their subject of abuse. Creating false scenarios in order to make themselves look good. Dr. Death, once again and later emotional and even financial abuse. Domestic violence also often starts with emotional abuse. And the evident narcissism led Stephen to belittle and demean Mariah, which caused her self-esteem to erode over time. He used his manipulation charm to isolate her from her friends and family, as evidenced by what happened with her therapist. Which if you haven't heard about this yet, just wait. But all of this would end up leaving her feeling helpless and alone, even questioning her own motives, which is what he wanted. Statistics show that domestic violence is a ubiquitous issue, and sadly, it can and often does escalate to murder. Mariah, in her desperation to protect herself, her children, and her home, sought help from local authorities and even ultimately became a human shield for her children. Prior to April 10th, She had grown increasingly disturbed by his emotional abuse and manipulation, and even fearful for the safety of her and her children. And at the same time, hearing a silent scream from her gut that Stephen's behaviors were growing more and more unpredictable and threatening just beneath the surface. Please listen as Mariah continues her recollection of events that led to the tragedy that occurred April 10th, 2023. So we planned our wedding in three weeks and ended up getting married in our backyard or in the backyard of his house that I got to live in when he decided to let me. And um, not long after that, he was asking for another baby. And I did not want a child, another child. I did not want another child with him because he had told me when I was living in that rental house after we had had our daughter, Um, that he wanted to get me pregnant again because if I had two children with him and only one child with my first husband, then I would have to listen to whatever he said. I'd have to go where he wanted me to go. I'd have to leave my son with his dad and there was nothing I could say. So I knew in my heart that he wanted me to have another child with him to manipulate me. And I was like, look, we just got married Let's see how that goes. Let's see if things get better between us. And then we can talk about bringing another child into this. And so there was a moment where we were, you know, being intimate together. And I wasn't on birth control. Birth control gives me, I have an autoimmune condition. Birth control gives me the worst side effects. I've probably tried them all. And um, anyway, he... He knew that, and I don't know if he was tracking my ovulation cycle, I don't know, but the one time we had unprotected sex because I trusted him, I ended up getting pregnant with our second child because he refused to obey my wishes on not wanting a second child and told me that if I told anyone, they wouldn't believe me because I was his wife. And so luck has it that I got pregnant again. And at that point, like I knew things were just different. He wasn't connected to my pregnancy. When I was having her, I mean, he was standing on the other side of the room 
He looked disgusted. We could all feel like the tension that he was putting off, um, just this, just this darkness, you know? And even after I had our second daughter, he didn't want anything to do with her. And the moments that he did were only so he could see me. He was using our daughters as pawns, 100%. And he had ended up kicking me out when I was 36 weeks pregnant with her. And after I had her, I guess she was three months old, kind of a similar thing, wanted to take a family trip because he said he was having a hard time connecting to her and blamed it on the fact that we were living in separate homes and he really wanted to make things work. We ended up going to the Texas coast, to the beach. This was the same place that we went when he convinced me to marry him. And so we were at the coast. He owed the IRS a lot of money and he was on the phone with the revenue officer that was assigned to his case. And so I could tell he was upset. It's a difficult conversation, I'm sure, when you owe over a million dollars to the IRS, because that was another thing. He was a gambling addict and he apparently lied to the IRS too. He didn't, typical narcissists, they don't feel like they have to obey the laws. They feel like they are above the law and so they do what they want and then deal with the consequences later and then try to weasel their way out of it. So he was just kind of doing that on a broad spectrum in every aspect of his life. So he had just gotten off the phone with the revenue officer and I was like, you know, let's take the girls and go get ice cream, something just kind of low key and just trying to do something that wasn't so stressful for him. And so we're sitting in the ice cream shop and um, out of nowhere, he tells me, if I had to line all four of my children up in front of a firing squad, I would only choose to save Rosalie, our almost two at the time. So he would gun down or have our three month old gun down and his two other children and only save Rosalie. It came from nowhere, like just totally out of the blue. And I'm like, we're sitting here having ice cream and you're fantasizing about murdering our child? And I was so just pissed off. I was disgusted. And so I immediately got up and I'm like, nope, I'm done. We're out of here. I'm going back to San Antonio. I don't want to even look at you. And so I told him, get in the car or else I'm leaving you here. You're gonna stay at this ice cream shop. He gets in the car and starts telling my daughter Rosalie, cause she's crying, whatever. She's upset cause we left the ice cream shop. And he starts telling her, it's okay. You don't have to cry. Cause daddy's gonna kill himself soon anyway. Like daddy's gonna be gone. And so then I start yelling at him for telling her. It's like, that's totally inappropriate. I don't know what it is with you and death right now, but like, just don't talk anymore. And so he basically tells me that the reason he wants to die is because he's so tired of looking at me. He's so tired of being around me and insinuated that all I do is yell at him. And I don't, I'm not a yeller. Like it's actually probably more annoying because I'm so non-confrontational that I'm like, you know what? fine, you win, you know? And so anyway, he's telling me all of this, how like disgusting I am to be in the same car with and how repulsed he is. And then proceeds to jump out of the car while it is moving, tucks and rolls and jumps out, you know? So then my daughter is screaming. She's freaking out because her father just jumped out of a moving car. So I turn around because I'm a good person and I go back for him. And at this point, yes, I'm yelling at him because he just jumped out of my car. And so I'm trying to get him to go like get back in the car. He won't. Um, I end up calling my son to tell him what just happened. And I'm like, look, your dad is losing it. And I need you to convince him to get back in my car so we can get back to San Antonio because I can't deal with him or I'm just going to leave him here and someone else is going to have to come and get him. And so anyway, somehow I get him back in the car. We drive to the house that we're renting for the weekend. And he like continues to say how he's gonna kill himself. And he restrains me so I can't leave. The girls are already in the car, thank goodness. And I finally 
I get away from him and I go and get in the car. And so I immediately call, first I call the suicide helpline because I'm like, that's the last thing I need to deal with is, you know, knowing that because I left him, he committed suicide. Even though he was extremely flawed, he was still the love of my life. And I still, like, I would never wish harm on him. You know, he was the father of my children. I didn't want him to do anything to himself. So I call and they tell me to call like the non-emergency number for the local police. And so I do, police officer comes out. I even call to get that police officer's phone number so I can personally talk to him to see what's going on because I'm concerned. And I guess whenever I got there, he had taken a bunch of stuff. I don't know, but the police officer said he was acting completely belligerent and he was slurring his speech and he found him with a bunch of prescription pills and he truly believed that he was a harm to himself and other people. So he brought him to the local hospital, I guess admitted him for a mandatory 72 hour psych evaluation. Well, because my ex-husband has been a nurse practitioner for over 20 years and he's charismatic and he knows exactly what to say to manipulate people. He said all the right things and they let him out after four hours. So the one chance for him to actually maybe get some help, they just let him go. And so, you know, the that was in June of 2022 when he was admitted. And I even told him, I'm like, there's no way I'm letting you have our kids unsupervised until we go somewhere in San Antonio to get another psyche valve because I don't believe that you're safe and I don't feel comfortable leaving my kids with you. And so we go to like a, a psychiatric urgent care facility here in San Antonio and I'm explaining to the psychiatrist what's going on, what my concerns are. And it seemed like she was really on my side. Like she understood where I was coming from, what I was saying. And so like we spoke separately and then she spoke with him. And once, once he was in the room with her by himself, he completely turned it around again, just like he did in the hospital. And so we come back together in the same room after she's spoken to him. So this professional woman, the psychiatrist who's been practicing for 30 years or more, maybe more, she looks at me and she says, Mariah, he's just angry with you. You almost cost him his medical license because you called the police on him. So he's just angry with you and he needs some space. And maybe you should apologize to him for putting him at risk. That was a tough pill to swallow. So I'm like, between his gaslighting and then these, you know, him being released from the hospital and then this other lady telling me it was my fault, I started to actually wonder, like, maybe it really is me like maybe he's right which obviously now i know is total baloney but uh yeah if that's not gaslighting i don't know what is after saying he was going to have our three-month-old daughter gunned down so many missed opportunities for people to like tell this man that something's wrong with him we saw the same counselor, a marriage counselor for two years. She never once told him like, hey, maybe you're the problem. It was all, like he would leave the room and she'd be like, look, I'm on your side. Like, this is you. And she told me that if I would just maintain a level of emotional intelligence that was greater than his, then I'm in control. Then maybe I can make him be the person I want him to be or what like that's horrible advice horrible Stephen had a history of lying elaborate lying and I know we kind of went into some of that but there was one thing in particular that was such a big lie and it was drawn out for years. And there were so many people involved in this lie that I can't not share it because this just shows how masterful 
he was and how much thought he put into this life that he created, this persona that he created. So he was a nurse practitioner and I mentioned how he often lied and told people he was a medical doctor. Well, he also had this other life. Um, He had, I'm sure in his younger years, part of it was true. Um, He had worked with this other man who had a business and they worked with musicians and they would do like their on the road medicine kind of stuff. When they would come to San Antonio and do a concert, they would give them like B12 shots or, you know, if they had a specific medical need, well, he would help to do that for them uh, at whatever music venue they were at. So anyway, there's like pictures of him with different musicians. So I know at one point, yeah, he absolutely did do medical treatment on certain famous people. However, he took that so much further. He introduced himself as this rock doc. That's what he called himself, the rock doc. And he created different LLCs that didn't go anywhere or do anything or make any money. Um, So there was no evidence of him ever taking care of anyone. However, he had this game room in his house full of memorabilia, guitars, cowboy hats, um, drum heads, drumsticks, posters, you name it, he had it from, you know, down to like signed baseballs. And he was like, yeah, so I do this not to make any money, which like, why wouldn't you make money? Because they're all millionaires. Um, But he's like, I don't do it to make money. I just, I really like the experience and I like going to concerts and they always send me really cool stuff and it's like personalized to me. And this is the legacy I've created. This room shows the 20 plus years of, you know, me being in medicine and all the people I've helped. And at first, I thought it was true. I, I mean, the proof was there. Everything was hung on the walls and he had stuff in closets. I mean, he had a plethora of memorabilia. And so I, I believed it for a long time and I thought it was so cool. And every time he'd invite someone over for a drink or whatever to play pool, because he had a pool table in there as well, he would tell them about this lifestyle that he had where he would take care of all of these people and you know it was the same story over and over again and one day I he would always fall asleep with his iPad and I can't remember what it was I think maybe he fell asleep with his eBay account open somehow I came across his eBay account and I see on there that he had purchased all of this stuff with his own money so not a single thing was sent to him He purchased all of it, which like if you have the means to buy all of this collectible stuff, like that's still cool. You don't have to lie. Like the lie is totally unnecessary, but he did it to create this, you know, this image and to garner all of this attention and to make himself seem valuable. So, I mean, for years, it took him years to create this room and just he took that lie and ran with it to the point where even at his business he would hang guitars up in the the emergency room like the patient rooms he would hang them up with a picture of him to like tell patients oh look i'm the rock doc you got the cool guy today and so like even it was involved even with his patients um some of the stuff i found out that he personally signed Like, it wasn't even signed by that person, whoever, you know, it was. He told me when his mother passed away, Kenny Chesney sent him a cowboy hat. Not true. He bought it on eBay and signed it. Um, Like, he would sign, thanks, Dr. Steve, for taking care of us, you know, from whoever, the Jonas Brothers or whatever. I mean, elaborate, I'm telling you. So when I would go to people and tell them, like, hey, this is what's going on. This is how this man is 
on a day-to-day -day basis with me as his wife, they wouldn't believe me because they're like, he's so nice, he's so cool. Um, you know, look at all of this stuff he has done professionally. It was all a facade and no one would believe me because I was just one person and they'd known him for years and years and years. Um, and different things have come out since our attack. And I would share it with like his friends that he's known since he was a child. And I'm like, hey, do you remember when this happened to him? Um, and they were like, no, that, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, he said he was a, a fighter and would describe these fights he got in and bars and stuff. And his friends were like, he's not a fighter. He's never gotten in a fight. He always had people around him to fight for him. He would run his mouth and then they would fight for him. So it was like just layers upon layers of like, I don't think he even knew who he was. And it's just, it's alarming. And I'm really sorry for him. You know, whenever I found out that his entire game room was all fake, I only told his son I didn't tell anyone else because I was like, how humiliating would it be for him? And I truly felt sorry for him because I don't know what it's like. I'm one of those people, like I have, I just, I am who I am. And I've gotten to the point in my life where I'm comfortable enough with who I am. If other people don't like it, that's okay. I don't have to lie or create personalities or, you know, alter myself to fit these social expectations. And so I felt really bad for him because I was like, how exhausting would it be to have to create an entire person to hide behind because you're so miserable? Yeah, it was exhausting. He told colleagues, patients. I mean, our entire community, we're from a very small, tight-knit community within San Antonio. Um, like I said before, San Antonio is a big city, but it's also a small town. Everyone knows everyone. They're, the circles are just small. And so when it happened, everyone was blown away because he had fooled everyone. April the 10th was a Monday. It was the day after Easter. Stephen had our daughters that weekend, so I hadn't seen them since Thursday when I dropped them off at daycare. And I had been sick that weekend, so we didn't really, my boys and I didn't do anything for Easter. I went to work Monday morning and it'd been pretty, pretty quiet. Um, I hadn't seen Steven. He dropped the things off on Easter, the flowers and the card, like I mentioned before. Uh, but other than that, like, it was pretty quiet. And so Monday morning, it was, if I had to guess, probably around 9 or 9.30 in the morning, he sends me a text message. And it was like a meme of two Easter bunnies. And like one bunny had bit the other bunny's ear off. And the bunny was like, oh, I can't hear. Um, so I guess he was like trying, I don't know if he was trying to start a conversation or if he was trying to be funny. Um, but I was like, oh, Easter humor, I love it. But then he didn't say anything after that, and neither did I. I got off of work, usually when it was my day with the kids, I would get off of work at two, so that way I could pick the girls up for 2.30. So I did, and I, um, I picked them up from school, and Willow, at the end of her school day, they always took her in this little buggy, like this, I guess it fit, fits like six kids, six little babies in it. And they push her around campus and um, she was her favorite part of the day. She loved that darn buggy with all her little friends. And um, I remember just locking eyes with her and she was so happy to see me. And so I picked her up out of the little buggy and we would just, she and I would walk to go get her sister, Rosalie, from the other side of the school. And I just, you know, we would snuggle the whole way. I'd kiss her and she'd just kind of nuzzle my neck. And it was just like the sweetest moment that we would have Monday through Friday, just me and her by ourselves. And I cherished it. But I wish I had walked just a little bit slower. And we finally, we get to Rosalie's class 
And she would always just, as soon as she would see me, she would dart and just run to me as fast as she could. And so I'd have Willow in one hand and I grabbed Rosalie with the other. And, um, you know, we left the school and that was the last time I would ever pick Willow up from school. And we went to go pick up my boys. They went to a different school down the street and we headed home. And what we always do when we first get home, we kind of decompress. I'll usually get down on the floor with them and we'll play and uh, just snuggle and talk about our day and just kind of soak them in because one, they were gone all weekend and I missed them. But we also all needed to just kind of decompress before homework starts and making dinner and that whole that whole thing. Um, so we did that and then it was time to like do homework with my boys and um, I made dinner, although I cannot remember for the life of me what I made. Just one of those things that we do every day, but you know, we don't put much thought into it. And I, Willow was, she was taking some steps. I had been really intentionally practicing with her because she was just, I could tell she was eager to do it. She just wasn't confident enough to walk yet. And so every day I would just work with her a little bit. And that day she had taken like three steps by herself and I was so happy for her. So the first thing I do is call her dad because I'm like, I want him to be able to share this. Like I don't, just because we're divorced, I don't want to miss out on these moments with her. I don't want to miss out on milestones. Um, so I call him so he can also share that. And um, he seemed fine. He didn't seem angry. He was excited. Um, he was like, good for her, you know, that whole thing. And I hung up with him. And we continued on doing whatever. And I put my phone away. And at some point I was sitting on the couch and the last video I took of my daughters together, um, Rosalie was on my coffee table in her underwear because we're working on potty training, you know. Um, she's in her underwear on the table. The, both of my little pugs are on the table with her. <laughs> And Willow is just hanging onto the table, just kind of walking along the edge. And so I'm recording them just, you know, it's so funny that the dogs are on the table. And it was just one of those moments that I wanted to be able to look back at. And I'm thankful that, that I did because I would never have another opportunity to video record my daughter alive. And I took that recording at about between 6 p.m., 6.30, you know, around that time, right before our life was going to change forever. And I guess Stephen had called me and left a voicemail and then like promptly texted me. I didn't see it. I was recording them. It was my time with them. You know, I just, I didn't see it until after the police gave me my phone back. Um, but he said in the message, the text message and the voicemail, something along the lines of, hey, I just have a question, give me a call. And obviously I, I don't know what the question was. And I like to wonder like, what if I would have answered? Like, could I have said something that would have changed how things went? I don't know, it's just when something traumatic happens to you, you try to think of all the different scenarios how you could have changed things, you know, but it's also because I've lived a life of different types of trauma and I've been in a position where I have been neglected and abused. I have this horrible habit of placing blame on myself and apologizing for things that I shouldn't, that are not my fault. Um, so I have to remind myself to stay on track and that there's, this was gonna happen no matter what I said to that text message. Um, but 30 minutes later, my doorbell rings. I'm cleaning the house. The girls are on the floor playing. I've got one, I've got my eight year old in the shower and my, he was 10 at the time. My 10 year old was laying down, just kind of getting ready for bed. And um, the doorbell rings. I get up from what I'm doing and I answer the door and it's, it's Steven. And I thought 
Maybe he was just dropping by to see the kids. I didn't know if he had to work that day or not. Oftentimes when he had to work, he would stop by and see the girls or whatever. So I tried to give him open access to them because again, I wanted the same thing in return. And so anyway, I didn't think anything of it. I let him in the house. I was like, hey girls, your dad's here. So he talks to them for a minute and I go and I kneel down by our bookshelf to pick up all the books that Willow had knocked down. And there's, you know, I notice that there's no more communication between him and the girls and I feel his presence next to me. And so I look up and he's got a gun in my face. The link between domestic violence and homicide is all too real. According to statistics, domestic violence situations can escalate to homicide, especially when the abuser has narcissistic traits. This tragic case serves as a stark reminder of the dangerous intersection between narcissistic personality disorder and domestic violence. It further highlights the importance of recognizing the signs of abuse and seeking help before it's too late. Domestic violence is not just a statistic. It is a devastating reality that claims innocent lives, leaving a trail of heartache in its wake. You never truly know what will happen tomorrow, much less 12 hours later, even an hour later. With this in mind, I do pose a challenging question to you all. When you all say you sit and listen to your gut, do you really? I ask because I can recall several times where my gut was screaming at me deep within the depths of my belly, telling me that something was very much so off. I do have a plethora of examples, but I'll share two. While I'm not proud to admit that I usually ignored that feeling, I will say that my gut never lies to me and that something was very, very wrong in those moments. The day prior to when my dad passed away, my gut screamed at me. I ignored it. I went and got my nails done, walked my neighborhood, called friends, hung out with my dog, watched several reruns of King of Queens and Basketball Wives. I forced myself to feel peace, but my gut, it was just nagging at me, but I ignored it. Very early the very next morning, as I was preparing to go to bed finally after tossing and turning and trying to just ignore my gut, I received a phone call. It was from my brother and he told me that my dad had unexpectedly passed. Almost exactly 10 years later, a few days before my mom died, my gut screamed at me. I knew that feeling all too well, so I chose to actively pay attention to it. I could not focus at work for the life of me because all I could think about was my mom and how she was alone in the hospital. I received a phone call from her nurse telling me that my mom was improving, acting as sweet as she could be, and demanding diet ginger ales. I spoke with my mom afterward, and while my overthinking brain did ease up, my logic in my heart mixed with my gut said, she's not going to survive through tomorrow. That following morning, after somehow missing a ton of phone calls from the hospital, I did go to see her and I said my final goodbye. I think my point is this. We all have gut feelings, and we all tend to overlook them because our heart wants something the exact opposite of what our gut is trying to tell us. We're in denial in that moment. And while we all feel guilty for ignoring our gut, we shouldn't because, face it, none of us have much control of whatever situation our gut is warning us about or the outcome. And while we all should pay attention to our gut and try our best to be present in the moment and to try to change the narrative in which our gut is warning us about something horrifying, life does indeed happen with or without us present. Next week in part three. And his response was, get in the fucking car, Mariah. I'm going to kill you and every single one of your kids. You want to act like a whore? Well, you're not going to make it this time. And at that point, I realize that this is serious, that he's not joking. He starts punching me in the face. He starts hitting me with the gun. At one point, he started hitting me in the body with his knees and just totally beating the hell out of me because I'm trying to get this gun from him. I've got the police on the phone. I called 911. They're coming. You're going to be okay. They're coming. And so a part of me is like, okay, how can I 
I just need to stall. That's it. Someone is coming to help us. And as I'm talking to her, he's turning around to go back to the house. Go hide, get out of here, call 911. And so he gets off of his back and Steven turns to like go after him. We will hear more from Mariah who recalls the date in question, April 10th. And I'm coughing up blood and I get so weak and dizzy that I have to just crawl down my driveway. My eight-year-old son is sticking out of a broken window asking me if it's safe. And I, I wave him on, I, I can't talk, but I, I nod my head and he runs and he's wearing pajama pants because he was taking a shower and no one was prepared to have to run for their lives. Do whatever you can to advocate for her because it's your responsibility. No matter what your position is, when you are working with the public, it's your responsibility. Um, instead of thinking, why me? Start training yourself to think, why not me? It happens to, in Texas, one in three women. Why not you? Don't take it lightly. We also will conclude with what happened with the fact, supportive words, and more information regarding Baby Willow and the trial for Stephen Clare. For now, please always remember domestic violence victims and survivors. Like all victims and survivors are bees. Bees are strong, resilient, yet vulnerable. We must protect the bees at all costs. For without bees, we as a human race cannot survive or thrive in life. So be vigilant, for when you mess with the bees, you get the hive. Thank you for listening to A Nefarious Nightmare. The music used in the theme was originally by Ghost Stories Incorporated, remixed by Ryan RCX Murphy. Additional background music is provided by Epidemic Sound. A Nefarious Nightmare is scripted, researched, and produced by Courtney Fenner and Amanda Cronin. I'm Lainey Hobbs, and as always, be vigilant, for when you mess with the bees, you get the hive. The hive.